Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In the previous lectures, we've talked about Kennedy's presidency and some of the early actions in Vietnam. In this lecture, we'll continue that discussion and focus on the signature program of Kennedy's presidency, the Strategic Hamlet Program. At the end of the last lecture, I talked about how General Paul Harkins, as the head of the Military Assistance Command in Vietnam, consistently requested the three M's, money, men, and materiel. Typically, he got them. By the end of 1962, there were more than 11,300 American personnel in South Vietnam, and the U.S. was spending on average 500 million a year and climbing. These numbers of troops included growing numbers of women, mostly serving as nurses. There were several hundred nurses in that number already. In a future lecture, I'll talk much more about the role of nurses in Vietnam. Most of the 11,300 were soldiers. They included many officers. Harkins placed the soldiers at every level of command within the Arvin. They provided tactical advice and training for Arvin soldiers. The advisors and Harkin hoped to convince Diem to abandon its so-called fortress psychology and go after the Viet Cong. Diem was actually hindering Arvin efforts against the Viet Cong by much of his action. He was so paranoid that he called the best Arvin units back to defend his palace, leaving the countryside open to the Viet Cong. Diem was also paranoid about losing a major battle or sustaining casualties that it might undermine his regime. He was also paranoid about winning major victories as it might create a general popular enough to overthrow him. Thus, GM was rooted in inaction. The United States also provided pilots and air support for the Arvin. They trained Vietnamese pilots, dropped leaflets and supplies, and transported troops. By 1962 and 63, Often frustrated with the Vietnamese pilots, some of the American pilots had begun flying combat missions on their own. The Navy and Marines also had troops in Vietnam. The Marines, in 1961, launched Operation Shoe Fly, which transported Arvin troops into battle in helicopters. They also trained the Arvin in amphibious operations. The Navy and Marines also implemented a plan designed by Krulak. This was Operation Plan 34A. Building on similar operations from World War II and Korea, Krulak envisioned PT boats patrolling the shoreline of North Vietnam and launching missions. They might attack radar sites, blow up bridges, highways, and ammunition dumps, then retreat quickly. These were special operations along the coast. Kennedy approved Operation Plan 34A, sometimes called Op Plan 34A, on November 20th, 1963, just a few days before his assassination. Over eight years, under Operation Plan 34A, American forces conducted more than 1,000 covert missions. By late 1962, all these operations seemed to be having a positive effect. The Arvin totaled about 210,000 troops, equipped with American-made weapons supported by American and Arvin pilots. Some of these Arvin units began to attack the Viet Cong, with occasional successes. Harkins was pleased with the results. He began keeping a daily scoreboard, updating developments, tabulating combat missions, search and destroy missions, bombing runs, and casualties. By the end of 1962, the numbers looked good. As Robert McNamara said in a press conference, every quantitative measure we have shows we're winning this war. Back home, there wasn't much popular interest in these early stages of the war. The television was still clogged with shows celebrating the successes of World War II. Shows like McHale's Navy and Hogan's Heroes, even comedies, took a pro-military approach. Even on bumbling escapades, our military is victorious. Comic books as well promoted the war effort, 
from G.I. Joe to Jungle War stories, comics depicted the United States prevailing over enemies. At this point, there was virtually no anti-war movement, and few voices spoke out against the war within the administration. Building on this tone of early success, Kennedy authorized a more extensive campaign in the counterinsurgency effort, the Strategic Hamlet Program. It was a newer version of the Agraville Program under GM. It began in March of 1962. The Strategic Hamlets were to be peasant villages surrounded by barbed wire and minefields. They would have schools, community centers, stores, and pharmacies. American pilots were then free to fire upon any Vietnamese seen outside the hamlet who were considered, by definition, Viet Cong. This was considered too large a project for Americans to undertake, so control of the project passed to Diem, who delegated it to his brother, Wo Din Nu, who we talked about in a previous lecture. Nu undertook the project with a vengeance. By late summer 1962, New claimed to have built 3,225 hamlets and placed more than 4 million peasants behind the protective barbed wire. The strategic hamlets were enforced in unfortunate ways, though. Tens of thousands of peasants were forced at gunpoint to build the camps, to dig the trenches that surrounded them, then to burn their own homes. They were then trapped in the villages, which were often poorly supplied. There were issues of sanitation and health, and the purpose was not always made clear to the villagers, and there was no way to know for certain whether the Viet Cong was kept out or not. In fact, the Viet Cong saw the strategic hamlets as an opportunity to win new recruits. They used a simple recruiting strategy. When the GM regime fails and the Americans leave, you will be able to go home again. So help get rid of them, and you go home. The Viet Cong also infiltrated the program from within. Unbeknownst to New, the man he appointed to head the program, Colonel Pham Wok Thao, was a Viet Cong agent. Thao's strategy in building the hamlets was to be as ruthless as possible to alienate as many peasants as possible. Conflicting reports coming from South Vietnam increasingly looked grim in 1963. The main force of the Viet Cong increased steadily throughout the Kennedy presidency. More forces were moving south on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which I'll discuss much more in a future lecture. The Viet Cong numbers increased from about 3,000 in 1960 to 10,000 in 1961, 17,000 in 1962, and 35,000 in 1963. They also seemed to have no trouble in finding weapons. While they were supplied by both the Chinese and Soviets, many of their weapons were actually American-made. The weapons supplied to the Arvin readily made their way into VC hands. Several Arvin outposts were notorious for having their weapons disappear. United States air power also contributed to the growing VC recruitment efforts. The number of monthly sorties increased from 1960 to 1962, from 50 to more than 1,000. They dropped napalm, rockets, bombs, and strafing against the VC. But such weapons are indiscriminate, and many innocent peasants were injured and killed. Many others lost family members or homes to the bombings and turned to the Viet Cong for revenge. By the end of 1963, the main force of the Viet Cong of 35,000 was reinforced with a village militia estimate more than 100,000. There's really no way to know how many more were secretly aiding the Viet Cong effort. In the next lecture, our last about the presidency of John F. Kennedy, we'll talk about the demise of the GM regime.